So welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the Garrison Institute Pathways to Planetary Health Forum. I'm Jonathan Rose, the co-founder of the Garrison Institute. Before we begin today's session, let's review a few logistical items about our gathering. This is a Zoom webinar, and so participant, that means you, audio and video will remain off for the duration of the webinar, but that doesn't mean that you're totally silent. Um, you can put any questions you have in the Q&A box below, and we monitor those and we integrate those into the conversation. So although you may not hear your precise question asked, um, it will influence the flow of the conversation. We're recording these sessions and you'll have a chance to view recordings as well as the schedule of upcoming programs at garrisoninstitute.org. And if you like this conversation, we encourage you to go back to our website and get a link and share it with friends. This interactive online event is part of our Pathways to Planetary Health Forum 2022 series, in which we're exploring the topics of regeneration across four pathways, Half Earth, which is preserving biodiversity, ecological civilization, which is really the key of today's talk, which is how do we build, make our energy, transport ourselves, grow our food, et cetera, in ways that actually align with the natural ecology rather than disrupt it, regenerative economics, and the idea of the common good. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our guest, Jamie Bristow. Jamie is the co-director of the Mindfulness Initiative, a policy institute about mindfulness and compassion, compassion training that grew out of a program of mindfulness teaching for politicians in the British Parliament. And after supporting UK politicians to establish the UK Mindfulness All-Party Parliamentary Group and conduct a policy inquiry through 2014, Jamie took over as director in 2015 to launch the seminal Mindful Nation UK report. He has since grown the Mindful Initiative into an influential policy institute, authoring and producing a series of publications and working with decision makers around the world to integrate inner capacities and contemplative practice into politics and the public landscape, public policy landscape. And Jamie actually just came back from meeting with the European Union on this. A recent research partnership with Lund University Center for Sustainability Studies has yielded the groundbreaking publication on the inner dimension of the climate crisis. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. And the role of mindfulness and compassion training to increase society's resilience. Jamie was formerly business development director for Headspace. He has a background in psychology, climate change, campaign communications, advertising, and many other wonderful things. Um, Jamie, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan. So lovely to be here. It is that wonderful to program. be here. It is wonderful to be here. And, you know, interestingly, typically, the guests and I are far apart. So our last guest was in, uh, uh, we spoke to was in the Arctic. Uh, Jamie and I are both based in um, in Oxford right now, so mm -hmm. we're, we're almost around the corner. Um, so, Jamie, how did you become, how, what was your personal story? What led you to mindfulness in the first place? And then tell us about developing the vision for what mindfulness could be, not just as a personal practice, but having mm. a significant contributor to society. Mm. Well, I was lucky enough to be taught to meditate when I was about 18. I turned up at university and like many students joined tons of different societies. And one of those that was offered for the first time that year was the uh, Buddhist and Meditation Society. And I was staggered that I could close my eyes for 10 minutes and have some uh, influence on you know, the condition of my inner landscape. But I didn't think much of it. I mean, it, it was a fun thing to do, you know, like a novel, novel thing. Um, and I, um, I binged on Buddhism, as I, as I, as I, as I, as I, as I called it, throughout my twenties. You know, I didn't. It wasn't the main thing of my, my life until I was working in advertising, trying to work really long hours, like trying to um, basically concentrate better and be a better advertiser. And it was that I used meditation more consistently for, so that I could yeah stay at my desk essentially. <laughs> and um, and like many people who get in for it, into it for this self regulation benefit, I then I then started moving on to kind of self exploration. And, and then I realised you know that actually there was more to me 
that I realized more going on in my mind and heart. And um, I guess more going on in the world than, than I had uh, I had previously acknowledged as well. And uh, ultimately that, that kind of knocked me out of the advertising uh, vortex. Um, and, uh, and into and into climate change stuff because it was because through my practice I started to that uh, sort of greater sensitivity and awareness that you get helped the same facts land in a different way so I went from from that world to initially volunteering and then working in a in, in a in a climate change campaign communications and um and like many people back then like 2009 2010 started to get a bit disillusioned with what we were doing then, which was telling people the facts about the situation. And it wasn't, wasn't going so well. So I reflected, you know, why did I suddenly go from, you know, being a black knight of consumerism to being a poacher turned gamekeeper and, and going to try and, you know, do the opposite. And uh, yeah, I credited my meditation practice. And so that's really what started me on, on the journey of, of, of thinking, Wow, there's a missing piece here, and actually, you know, this these individual practices that I got so much out of have a societal dimension, and no one seems to be really talking about this. Um, so, so yeah, that's that kind of conditioned the last twelve years of my life. Before we continue the story, which I want to do, I want to just track on one thing that you said, uh, which is that you started the mindfulness practice so that you could be better and more focused and put in longer hours at your existing job, but somehow it changed you. Mm -hmm. And we actually know the neuroscience of meditation um, actually uh, recenters can actually restructure the uh, reorganize or grow different parts of the brain and more importantly grow patterns in the brain and make us think more strategically, make us be more compassionate and feel wholeness. And so it's an amazing stealth uh methodology if you think about it because there are more and more people who are using mindfulness uh as almost like a performance uh, i'll say two things as a performance uh method but also because we're living in a much more anxious age and we'll talk later about ego anxiety and to release some anxiety and it is effective for those but it actually might also be the tool that expands their minds and gets them to see the wholeness of life feel compassion for that and take more compassionate action. Mm. Yeah, so there's, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. I mean, I was going to say there's, there's, um, there's good reason to, to believe that. And I'm sure we'll go on to talk about it. it may also, there may also be things that we can do in addition to the meditation practice, which make that more likely. Oh, so why don't you tell us what those are? <laughs> well, this has been one of the most live debates in the mindfulness training field, at least the part that I, you know, I operate in, which is thinking about the societal impact of these practices. And, and the question is, are they on their own enough? You know, for some people like me, you know, I, I, I think they were, um, I didn't really get into much of the sort of the philosophy behind them. I, it was mainly the meditation practices. Um, but there's, there's reason to believe that um, the, some, like the worldview that you come with, for instance, might uh, condition the outcomes of the practices and um, uh, there's if, if we're if we're interested in spreading spreading these um, for you know for, for, to create a more flourishing society a more sustainable world um, we need to think about the way in which the courses are couched the way in which they're framed some of the teaching content to particularly broaden the lens of inquiry not just thinking about where my distress comes from in my immediate life you know my boss my like my, my um family and how i might be able to you know navigate that you know, um learning about my stress physiology or my likelihood to get into a depressive loop like the, you know, the applications in clinical practice but broadening the lens to look at actually where where does distru distress and flourishing come from at the, at the group level at the community level as a society level and how do we use these this greater sense of agency and awareness to intervene you know collectively um that's, and then that's that some people have called social mindfulness mm, which is actually very important and you went for a super leverage point with that because you then started working on the idea of could we make the parliament more mindful 
Yeah, well, I can't be credited with um, with coming up with the, the idea of introducing politicians to, to mindfulness training, which um, was the brainchild of, an, of a member of parliament back in 2013, Chris Ruan, and uh, his a colleague in the House of Lords called Richard Layard. They, um, they had had some, you know, uh, experience with these practices, found them very helpful for them in their political lives, and invited the Oxford University Mindfulness Centre to start teaching. Um, and so since then, over 400 or so MPs and members of the House of Lords have had some mindfulness training. And, and a few of those, um, a good few, have really made it a big part of their lives and, and go to sort of weekly sitting groups, even silent practice days on a cross-party basis. And then that's when the kind of uh, uh, the interest in public policy came came through and I was one of the people who came together to support them to to look into the implications behind what they learned in their own practice. And I believe then some of those practices began to uh, pass on to the National Health Service and other and the social sector within UK, yes? Yeah, I, actually one of the things that made it catch on in the British Parliament was that mindfulness had actually been available on our national health service for almost 10 years by the time we introduced introduced it to politicians so it had you know an oxford stamp of approval because of the research and teaching center there and it had this sort of nhs you know the science had been checked for particularly treating depression so um so yeah and then certainly our policy initiative helped to to widen access for different things within healthcare we also looked at applying it in education in schools you know uh, in prisons and throughout the justice system and in a, a variety of workplaces as well so that that culminated after a series of um hearings in parliament in the publication of the mindful nation uk report um which we published in 2015 so that, the first public policy report about mindfulness in, in public life and it's a wonderful report do you have a link to it um for uh um, I do, yeah. I, I will stick okay. it in the ch in, in the so chat. So okay. why don't we stick that in the chat so that people yeah. um, can see that? Um, and let's also give them a, a a link to reconnection, meeting the climate crisis from the inside out, and that's really what we're going to focus some time on. Um, I want to read a quote from the executive summary of the report. You begin by saying, "Climate change is a physical reality, demanding urgent political and practical solutions." But its inner dimension, overlooked entirely by mainstream extreme approaches, is a crisis of relationship. Currently, the world is failing to implement solutions at a rate, scale, and depth required to meaningfully address climate change. Um, but the, grave, the um, this grave shortcoming is rooted in the same pathology that drives the crisis, lack of conscious connection with ourselves, with our others, and the world that we share. So I'd love us to begin talking about that. Mm. Very happy to. Do you have a question? So I guess my so so uh, we you know what's very interesting is um, so I mentioned earlier that I, my wife and I are living in uh, uh, in the Cotswolds right now. And we visited a stones, an ancient stone circle today that went back to uh, about 5,000 BC. And what was so interesting was these people created this magnificent circle of stones that had a spiritual meaning. That they, they, it's a large construction that took a lot of effort for a lot of people to put together. Hmm. And yet they lived as hunter gatherers. They didn't actually build huts for themselves. They didn't. So they had a sense of balance and relationship with the universe that felt, this is a projection of mine, but had a holism enough that they didn't feel an empty spot that had to be replaced by building a civilization. Mm. We have a very sophisticated civilization that provides more than enough of our wants and needs. Um, and yet there's this hunger, there's something missing. And there's this hunger within our Western culture that drives us to consume ever more, to, to believe in infinite growth. To, it, it's driving us in a way that is destroying the earth and destroying the, the beautiful complexity and emergence of life on earth. It's not destroying the emergent capacity, but 
um, it's leading to a enormous biodiversity loss and disruption of, of the climate. And so there is this inner, this outer issue uh, in the environmental world, the environmental say, if we just had enough wind power and some tidal power and some hydropower and a lot enough solar power and all that, we could solve all this. Those things are necessary but they're not sufficient mm. because my sense is the current state of human condition and human civilization, we will continue to hunger for more and more things that will continue to create more and more problems. So I guess that's, so you begin by saying, it's not just a problem of solutions, it's a problem of relationship. So now take it from there. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, yeah, as you say, you know, we've we started to make the link with, um, human activity and climate change 50 years ago. You know, we first started trying to create some kind of policy momentum in the uh, 80s. And, you know, we've had the IPCC, you know, the International Panel on Climate Change, really establish the evidence, um, you know, uh, 20 years ago or so. Uh, and it certainly hasn't really changed in terms of its severity and, and, and the call to action in, in 15 years. But yet, here we are. Um, and what uh, policymakers, politicians, academics, you know, researchers are starting to ask the question, you know, why, why haven't we acted? You know, really, we, we need an IPCC report about why we haven't acted on IPCC reports. And that's actually starting to some extent. You know, in fact, in the last report that came out in, in February and March, for the first time, started to include, you know, an inner, inner dimension and to say we needed an inner transition towards sustainability. And in, and in fact, mentioned meditation and yoga in the evidence section um, as, as things that could contribute to that. And... Uh, they're, they've been asking, you know, why, you know, why haven't we, why haven't we acted? We have the policy instruments at reasonable cost, um, and, and there's, you know, obviously a complex in, interaction b between the media and political will and culture and and the industry of of denial and delay and etc. Et um, but it all comes down to. Uh, how, our, how our minds, you know, the worldviews we have, the mindset we have, how our minds interact with each other. Um, and, and so in that way, we can say that the climate crisis is perhaps primarily a relationship crisis. And if, and if it's a relationship crisis, the, 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 the driver, the thing that's most um, wrong is that um, we are disconnected. Disconnected from uh, from nature, particularly, um, disconnected from from each other and from the consequences of our actions on the other side of the world, we are kind of insensible to the impact of our of our lives, and interrelated with that, we are we are uh, disconnected from ourselves. So there's a way in which um, we are uh, endemically numbed to our emotions. You know, uh, uh, alienated from our inner compass and, and, and our sense of sort of our values and, and, and what's important and, and from our and many of us from our from our bodies um, and these things all interrelate so for instance you know body awareness is really important for empathy which is really important for connecting to others um, uh, similarly for you know nature connection it's very difficult to do that if we're not we haven't got um, uh, some control over our uh, attentional faculties and we're actually actually able to um, to sort of connect to our senses and be be in in nature. So um, this is the, the 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 framing that we used um, for for the work to try and explain um, that there's a missing dimension to our to our thinking and to our acting on on the climate crisis. And we framed mindfulness and compassion as two examples of of, of um, evidence based practices that are that are have all, always been, um, or rather the, the, the natural human capacities of mindfulness and compassion have always been important for human connection and are particularly vital at, at this time. Uh, and what we're seeing in, in sustainability science is 
and uh, and to some extent in policy making, is that this um, that this inner dimension is is starting to get you know a, a, a seat at the table. And it's not to say that that um, uh, that this is the, the the thing that we need to change and everything else will be fine. You know, as it, as you read out in that report, you know, climate change is a physical problem that needs you know uh, physical technical solutions. But it can't only be addressed at that level because it's a kind of like a you know a Gordian knot you know of all all of these different things in in entwined and we need more integrative um, approaches that don't just focus on 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 the external and um, you know as, as as part of our research so I'm, I, I, in order to um, to make a skillful intervention in this area to to tell a good story about it to create a framework that threads together all the evidence base I worked with a sustainability sciences professor who's uh, really one of the kind of leading um, uh, academics in, in the area of, of, of sustainability um, more broadly, but, but particularly this sort of intersection between inner and outer change. And she and I had a, a research partnership for a year, 18 months. And as part of that, we interviewed 25 politicians and policymakers, many of whom working at kind of, you know, sort of transnational level in the EU um, and other bodies. And, uh, and, and we asked them, you know, if you talk about this inner dimension, what do you talk about? Um, and uh, we, from that, we kind of created a created a, a map of like four four categories, four interactions between the mind and climate change. Um, the first of those, uh, which which politicians are most likely to be aware of, is that the mind is a victim of of climate change. You know, we're, we're seeing particularly young people um, having very you know uh, almost um, universal impacts. Um, on on uh, anxiety and grief and worry, and uh, nearly half of those see that as as interfering with their everyday functioning. And then we have um, you know, the mind as a barrier to action. There are ways in which we have biases and predictable things that you know that are you know our, our brains have evolved in a very to, to, to treat very different crises, very different threats. And then we have the kind of the mind as a driver of the climate crisis. And this is where I sort of started talking about that re reconnection narrative. And then finally, some, some politicians talk about an interaction between those three, so that there's a feedback loop between the mind being impacted, actually, rather than then acting to, to address the climate crisis, um, retreating and, uh, and, and uh, um, being less able to act in various ways. So, so we took all of that, we took all of that research um, those different categories of, uh, of interaction. We, we um, combined it with a large consultation with sort of hundreds of um, experts working in the area uh, with the evidence base more broadly for, for, for mindfulness and compassion training, particularly where it sort of um, meets sustainability and uh, pulled that all together into a, uh, a policy report, uh, which, which you have, uh, yeah. Which is available in our link. So, so what's interesting to me is, so the climate anxiety and eco-anxiety um, in many ways is justified. I mean, people are sensing a, a more threatening environment or an unstable, chaotic environment, unpredictable environment. And, uh, and it leads to people having their own sense of um, place and balance disrupted. It feels to me that one of the solutions is to have a vision for where to go for. That if we had a vision of what would be healthy, whole places that are achievable, um, that people could aspire towards it and then work towards those, that that might be a pathway out. So I'd love your thoughts on that and and other thoughts that you have about how to deal with this eco anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yes, the. Um... What we certainly shouldn't do with eco anxiety is medicate it or patho pathologize it to the extent that um, it's seen as something that we can practice away. Um, and probably the, the best thing we can do about it is is act and and have governments ser you know, take, taking it seriously and, and having a sense of, of, of progress and 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 vision. Um, and. Uh, um, but, but then there's also a role 
in it's, it's kind of a both and we need to sort of act on physical things to reduce the, the sort of discrepancy between what we need to do and what we're actually doing um and there are also ways in which we can make ourselves um more resilient in 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 in, in the context of of action um so you know mindfulness training has a really important um uh, sort of ethic of turning towards the difficulty very common phrase on a mindfulness course you know and, and as i mentioned before one of the impacts of actually feeling anxiety is to turn away is to bury your head in sand maybe even you know have some retail therapy go and you know buy something to distract you and make yourself feel nice in fact there's there's um a very influential theory called terror management theory which is that when our sort of we have existential threat we 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 actually bolster our ego by by doing things that make us feel sort of bigger and more substantial and that often involves buying and you know doing resource intensive things that was george bush's solution to the 9 11 attack he said go out and buy <laughs> go out and buy yes yes exactly and and so um uh you know actually if you if you talk to a lot of people who are working on the on, on, on the front line um uh you know they are engaged in, in in the in the climate issue but their their way of dealing with the burnout that, that many of them are feeling is to put everything in a box you know all of the grief all of the anxiety all of the the information they have to deal with on a regular basis it's like um and in fact i had this conversation just this weekend you know, put it in a box and don't look at it and 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 that that doesn't work so well over time because you know your body starts to to feel the strain you don't sleep properly um, your back hurts and you know various other things can can manifest and and you know you get into a burnout funnel but turning towards the difficult is a is a radically different strategy for dealing with these things really opening to them um and that can be a way that we can stay with the trouble but whilst well, without shutting down like maintaining kind of awareness and sensitivity um and and, and compassion for uh, for the world so that's one of the you know one of the sections sections of our right. report. So, so actually, know, let's let's you mind know, we should go through yeah, those. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Finish your. You were about to say something. Well, you, you, you also asked something something about vision, right? Like yeah, what, right. What, what are we let's do that towards? first. And 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 the next section of the report, actually, once we've done staying with the trouble, um, we have a section called holistic worldview and expanded identity, um, and this looks at i mean often when I, when people you know i give people the report i recommend a chapter that is close to what they already are working on they say but make sure you read the holistic intuitive and expanded identity uh you know couple of pages because i think that really is the crux of of uh, of, of of the issue um because uh you know, I, I didn't really un un unpack fully what i meant by you know disconnection and reconnection perhaps we can do that a little bit more but one of the one of the dimensions is not just like seeing the connection, feeling connected, but actually um, building that into an understanding of the world, which holds interdependency and interconnection in, in what, we, what, what we term a holistic worldview, rather than an independent worldview or worldview of separateness, where we have this sort of you know, illusory um, idea that we kind of like are, um, uh are able to do and act in ways that don't you know resonate through the harmonic web of life you know that, that that we are enmeshed in and in fact um a lot of the these issues of separation um like stem from some primary analogies even stories about who we are are we at the top of the pyramid you know humans in domination over nature we've been given nature in order to um, so this kind of goes back to the to, to, to the to the Greeks. There's the, like, like an inherent dualism in a lot of that thought, and then in some of the Abrahamic religions, and then we have our scientific revolution, and we have like reductionism, which is all about sort of like separating, splitting things off. You know, the mind's different from the body, humans different from the natural world, separate in some fundamental way, um, and and that's in contrast to perhaps indigenous uh, worldviews. Um, and many uh, ancient Eastern philosophies. And so this deeply conditions um, the way in which we, tr we treat the world. Um, if, if we see that you know, every action then sort of like resonates across a harmonic web of life, it's different from if, if we have sort of been given the world to exploit. Does that make, it, 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 am, 
am, am I being, uh, is my connection okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Um, and, and, and so, um, uh, and so there, um, there are important ways, I mean, so that sustainability scientists talk about this as a deep leverage point for change. Like this, this item, this, this aspect of a mindset. You know, we, we, we can do sort of shallow interventions on, on, on climate, you know, some policy tweaks here and there, get people recycling a little bit more, relatively easy to do in a relatively short term intervention, relatively you know, shallow impact. But if we want to sort of make an intervention which then cascades through a whole range of behaviors and decisions and you know, uh, sensibilities at an individual and collective level, we really need to get down to this, these deep stories, um, the worldviews that we have that make, make sense of who we are and how we fit into the grand scheme of things. And, and, and I think mindfulness and compassion have a, have a really important role to play here. Mindfulness particularly is associated with holistic intuitive mode of mind, which helps us to, to see the wood from the trees, see the bigger picture, see the patterns of relationships. And this I think can help us to tell the different stories, have a different vision of, of, of who we are. If you're going back to you know, what, what got me off on this, your question about vision, you know, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's enormously important and it needs to go as deep as, you know, what is a human, uh, how, does it, how does it interrelate with the natural world? Um, and, uh, yeah, and yeah, this is, uh, this is what um, the researchers think we need, to, we need to get to, to really shift not just the climate crisis, but the, you know, the many other um, uh, uh, you know, crises of transgressing planetary limits. So we really have to redesign civilization. <laughs> well, if we tell different stories, civilization will will get redesigned. That's 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 the proposal. Or we have different ways of understanding ourselves. Yes, and what's interesting is that we are seeing this reemergence of understanding relationality. This reemergence of this sense of interdependence uh, coming from all quarters. We're seeing, for example. Um, in science, that pure science itself is talking very much about how we construct ourselves, that we don't really actually have a self in the brain. There's this emerging field that Dan Siegel has been uh, the father of called interpersonal neurobiology that um, uh, is really looking at, so that's the interpersonal neurobiology, the idea that actually even that there is a neurobiology. We've already understood now that Forests have an interpersonal neurobiology that they are all connected at their roots of this amazing rhizomal system in which they're in constant communication. Um, so science is getting us there. And I'm seeing more and more in, in uh, social theory, is, which is you know growing out of complexity theory, that people are understanding the interdependence effect. Uh, um, so the conceptual framework is growing. Mm -hmm. um, we now just need society to catch up. So what are your thoughts about how we get society to catch up? Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time to be aware of how um, many of the ancient wisdom traditions are, are having their basic insights validated. Um, and it's, it's, you need to be careful not to uh, sort of overclaim or... Um, uh, make too much of the the um similarities but as you say like insights into um mycelium networks and and, and, and quantum physics etc really uh turn turn wisdom of, of just 50 years ago completely completely on its head and to make this i think there there, there have been already some excellent storytellers who have who have been um talking in ways in which uh, we can start, yeah, re-perceiving ourselves in the way that I was just, I was just advocating for. So Joanna Macy has been doing this work in a, in a kind of a meditative container. You know, she's been doing mindfulness informed work um, called the work that reconnects uh, at a kind of group level, you know, have, have um, you know, writers like Charles Eisenstein and others. Uh, and, um, I, I, and I, I think storytelling is in a, in a, in a really important part combined with, with, with practice. Um, like the, 
the developing these sort of foundational capacities that can help us see the same facts differently, um, not just facts about what's happening to the climate, um, but can help us be sort of sensitive to and have the cognitive flexibility to, sh to shift our mindset. I think it's a com combination of like mainstream storytelling through film, through books. Um, like I'm, I'm halfway through reading Overstory, if you come, come across mm, this, yeah. Yeah, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2019. Perfect example of, 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 of mainstream fiction, which is really helping us to, um, to, to, to see our interdependencies. And uh, yeah, and so I'd say, I'd say a combination of art and, and practice and those kind of foundational capacities that help us to, 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 to be more flexible and fluid in our, in, 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 and, and, and sensitive to novelty and you know, open and, uh, and curious that the other kind of uh, core attitudinal foundations of mindfulness. And, yeah. Right. So you, in your report, you have something you call the fundamentals of connection. So let's go through those. So you have mind, you have mind body, you have mind body heart. Mm. So you're going to walk us through the mind, mind body, and mind body heart. Yeah, sure. So we have we split our document into two halves essentially. The first half is looking at how connection is has always been vital to our survival and to our flourishing individually, mm -hmm. groups, and society. And we look at the kind of cognitive and emotional underpinnings of that of that connection. And we do that in, in you know, like, like you've just said, in, in, in these three different um, subsections. Now, um, in actual fact, these things aren't separate, you know, as we're, as we're starting to figure out, you know, we, we, we are emotional and embodied um, and extended, you know, this, this sort of scientist word for being kind of connected to our environment, like our, 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 our thoughts and who we are isn't just locked in here, we are, um, you know, we are sort of out there um, and you know the mind and the heart aren't separate either but you know you have to write a document that has a beginning and an end right you've got to you've got to go in and in it, through it in a linear fashion um, so we start out with 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 the mind and we start out with one of the most fundamental faculties um, which is attention so the faculties of attention pull together all these other faculties and render our world for us and uh, we, we highlight that this is always important, but, you know, where it is ne we've never needed to be more aware of the, the problems of our world, we, are, we have also never been more distracted and had our attention hijacked by, um, by very sophisticated um, you know, companies and, and technologies. So, so we, we, we look at how um, that has an implication for, for, for collective action, and how mindfulness at its core is a form of attention training. Of course, it's much more than that, but, but, but it could, uh, it, you know, probably isn't gonna do it on its own, but it could really help us to put in place the kind of psychic self-defense that we need in this age of, um, of, of, of social media giants and the kind of, uh, yeah, where attention is the new gold. Um, the, the we, we then move on to looking at how you know it isn't just about attending to things but broadening the bandwidth of our perception once we've managed to 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 to, to get present or get focused on what we uh, what we need to 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 address and uh, and how cognitive flexibility and perspective taking help us to see things from more sides to get more of a picture so again we introduce mindfulness as saying this isn't just attention training it's awareness um you know, it, it, yeah, so if it, we would define it as um, the capacity to attend intentionally to the here and now, what's happening inside ourselves and, and around us with openness, allowing curiosity and care. And these foundational you know, um, uh, attitudes sort of like work together to broaden the bandwidth of, of perception so that we're more sensitive and aware of particularly difficult and challenging information, which we otherwise close down. I don't have to sort of labor the point about how that's important, particularly in the context of challenging information about the climate. And, and, and then we, yeah, then we look at perspective taking. So, so from, from the mind, um, we, then, we then look at how the body has been 
ha has been ignored or, or at least um, uh, given a given a back seat in our understanding of ourselves, um, uh, and particularly in sort of you know, you know this this Western thought of reductionism and fragmentation. You know, as as Ken Robinson famously said, you know, people treat their their bodies like vehicles that take their mind from meeting to meeting, um, when in fact you know it's all completely interrelated it's one body mind system and so and so we look at particularly where people say like you know let's let's save the planet as if the planet is something separate from us and it's like it's an optional thing um as, as if the, you know saving the planet isn't saving ourselves our systems and our and our bodies and, and and we propose that that's you know just one hint that we have this sort of disembodied sense of ourselves living in a world of ideas rather than being you know, living organic organisms completely intermeshed and dependent upon the ecological systems that we're trashing. Um, and so, you know, we go on to that, but we talk about how embodiment is important um, foundationally and how mindfulness uh, is, is particularly a, a, you know, a body awareness training. It's one of the first things you do on a mindfulness course. Some but attention think, regulation, some embodiment stuff. But I think what you're saying is it's not only embodiment within the body, is the embodiment of a larger body, an expanded body that is actually part of an ecosystem. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, and when we go on from from that to look at uh, interpersonal neurobiology, essentially as you've mentioned, um, promoted um, by Dan Siegel, and the role of the threat response, um, whether you know we we uh, approach a situation or we um, fight it or, or or fly away from it or we indeed shut down and freeze um, depends upon the you know, what mode of um, neurophysiology we have um, and this is you know particularly when we're looking at a collective threat response this is hugely important and we also look at the role of trauma collective trauma intergenerational trauma. As well as individual trauma and how we can get stuck in certain threat response patterns whether that's shutting down and freezing and having a kind of numb disassociation or whether we we we, we respond in ways that are like, like fight or flight um can get kind of uh locked in by um uh yeah traumatic patterns and and again hugely important for for, for working together um, and it's interesting how policymakers I've, I've, I've spoken to about this report often highlight that as something they were completely unaware of. Either the idea of intergenerational trauma or the, or the fact that this is something that, oh, actually, the citizens that I'm sort of trying to think about, they have, the, you know, they have this you know, neurophysiology, which, which will uh, condition how they respond to the, I know, the laws I make or um, the way in which I, I, I speak in the world. So it should be basic training, I think, for politicians. Um, and then we then we look at the role of the heart, um, uh, emotional intelligence, and the kind of uh, the jewel of our evolutionary inheritance, um, compassion. Uh, and, and and from this point onwards, we really frame mindfulness and compassion as side by side, as foundational capacities that will make us more equal to the challenges uh, that we're facing together. And then you go on, and so your next section is on connection in the climate crisis. So you've described this disembodiment, this disconnection, this demand on our attention is drawing us away from these things. And now you're saying, though, that connection is actually a pathway to our solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I've already mentioned, we start we start off looking at um, this uh, staying with the trouble. So so once we've started to become more sensitive and aware of what's going on in, in the world from um, um, in order to stay with the trouble we both need ways in which we can better uh, understand you know, perceive understand uh, regulate integrate and learn from difficult emotions because we know that like you know anxiety and grief uh, and fear can actually be powerful motivators of action and they can be the opposite they can be deeply uh, problematic and, uh, and unproductive and it'll depend upon the inner capacities of citizens, which you know, which which it is. And so, and so, this inner work needs to be a, sort of integrated in our in our in our um, thinking about how we how we respond together. 
as important is upregulating and supporting the positive emotions like like hope, gratitude, and 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 what um, Barbara Friedrichsen calls positive emotional resonance, which help, helps us sort of to uh, to come together. And there's a big debate in the climate world about what's what, what's more effective: getting people scared or getting them hopeful and engaged. Um, and you know the jury really is out, but it 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 kind of depends on who they are and what kind of capacities they've got, what their threat response is like, what their level of trauma is like. And that's why this inner dimension needs to be considered when it comes to um, galvanizing collective action. So once we've you know, become greater, more sensitive, we've, we've turned towards the difficult and we have managed to deal with um, and stay, stay engaged once we, once we see how, how, how tricky this is, um, then we can start to um, sort of pull together these connections that we've seen into the holistic worldview that I've already already treated. Um, as well as holistic worldview, in fact, it was Dan Siegel who encouraged me to, 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 to investigate and write about the concept of expanded identity. Like compassion is, a, um, is, what, is, is one of the four, uh, five, four self-transcending emotions, along with like it's all gratitude, compassion, I put myself on the spot. I never start a list unless you really are sure you know the full full thing. But it's, don't but, worry, it's, it's it's a good one. <laughs> but yeah, so these these are these are emotions that help us to to actually have an identity and see ourselves bigger than just me, mm. um, and actually you know, approach a kind of like planetary identity even. Um, and uh, and and so there yeah there are ways in which mindfulness and particularly compassion practice can 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 help us shift our worldview of what's going on and our sense of ourselves. Um, we also in this in, in in this in this section look particularly at the um, the role of polarization in potentially completely throwing a spanner in our works. I mean it's amazing that there's you know some progress in the U.S. with Biden's uh, le legislation, but in many places. Um, that's that's not not the case, and it's becoming a culture war issue, and 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 uh, you know polarization as a as a as a kind of ramping up of a, of, of a separateness worldview and a, a fragmentation could be a real problem. So not only do we want to reconnect, we need to stop the ways in which we might actually fracture even further. And th th there's evidence to and and this is you know like I say being being lent into by people who want to fragment fracture things in relation to climate. And interestingly, you know, mindfulness practice is associated by some early trials with a reduction in what they call affective polarization. So this is the extent to which we might distrust or dislike those who have a different view from us. And so, um, uh, yeah, when we move from that on to, uh, uh, and in this section we call sort of joined up world or the way, the way in which we can like um, see and act in the world in a joined up way. And, and uh, that wouldn't be complete without dealing directly with nature connection because it's part of our main narrative you know we're disconnected from self others ourselves others and uh, and nature and um the extent to which we see nature as something very different or like you know there's overlap in our identity we're sort of part of nature is one of the the greatest predictors of whether we will exhibit pro-environmental behaviors and whether we will sort of support pro-environmental policies and in fact, people who have, have high nature connection are twice as likely to exhibit pro-environmental behaviors. And as, as we know, just being in nature um, isn't necessarily enough to connect with it and to really feel part of it. You know, we could be uh, actually quite likely Instagramming it and, and, and making, you know, thinking more about our, uh, our, our, our following than, than our feelings. Um, but uh, that's why I think, um, Mindfulness has a particular role to play. That mindfulness helps nature connection. There's evidence to show that nature settings help the development of mindfulness, that actually they both support each other. And indeed, the, um, nature settings um, upregulate this holistic intuitive mode of mind. I mentioned briefly, but it didn't really explain. And that's to say, in contrast to what they call the, um, what cognitive scientists call the um, verbal conceptual mode of mind, which we use to manipulate tools and, and, and create our kind of complicated world. The holistic intuitive mo mode of mind, which some people think should be primary, is the wood from the trees, parallel processing, wisdom bit of ourselves. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and, and, and nature brings that online, mindfulness brings that online, and they all kind of like, yeah, support each other. So once we've 
sort of connected to nature, hopefully reduced our polarization a little bit and um, start to see things in a more joined up way. Uh, and we hopefully have some kind of intention to act. Unfortunately, there are still important disconnections and separ you know, se separations between what we, what we know and what we want, between what we want and what we actually do. And, and re uh, researchers call this the, the uh, values action gap. So this is, um, yeah, this is, this is uh, uh, well, well documented. And, and here again, both as a motivating factor, like compassion practice can be an enormous motivator, changing what we want, changing our sense of identity. Um, and we have, a, we have a section in this sort of final bit of the report about action called wiser wanting, um, which is to say that we can, we can bring, on, bring on board social mindfulness potentially, as we started talking about earlier on, and have a better sense of where flourishing comes from. Have a, have a have greater wisdom <laughs> essentially about the patterns of distress and 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 well-being in our own lives and in society and and to and to want more of the thing more more of the time things that are actually good for us and, and hopefully give a shift towards what research, researchers call intrinsic values which is those that are kind of like values for their own good you know like community and nature and and, and a sort of uh, yeah happiness um as opposed to extrinsic values, which are kind of means to an end, but people get kind of hooked up on those like money and status and you know, uh, power. And, and, uh, and so, so yes, th th there are ways in which inquiry and developing compassion can help us want wiser things, and then hopefully help us to act more in line with those intentions and those desires. Um, in fact, I, I worked with a, um, an economist, Dan Nixon, who um, was at the Bank of England, for um, for uh, some time, ten, 10 years, was it? Uh, he 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 wrote an interesting paper proposing that mindfulness could radically, uh, would, you know, could help us to simplify desires rather than satisfy them. Now, in economics terms, this is like heresy. It's madness. Like it's an assumption that we all just satisfy our desires blindly. But maybe actually we want to intentionally reduce what we what we want when we know it's not good for us and it's just going to lead to more wanting, etc. And, and ultimately um, an unsustainable impact. So, um, so we, we sort of finish off with um, where, where, where most people start with mindfulness teaching. And that is with the autopilot that we spend you know, a great amount of our lives in. You know, we, we are so much of the time acting invo involuntarily because of habits, because of cultural conditioning that we don't necessarily agree with, but it's just sort of the water we swim in. And, and, uh, and again, like a central tenant of, of, of mindfulness theory is that we're learning um, to practice. So we're, we're learning to respond uh, creatively, not react blindly to, to, to impulses and desires. And this, uh, I like to say, is basically living on purpose more of the time rather, rather than, you know, um, uh, yes, just because we're caught up in a, in, in a flow, of, flow of things we don't necessarily agree with. And so could this, could this reduce the, the, the gap between our values and our intentions? Anecdotally, practitioners say so. Anecdotally, they say they're more likely to say exercise, or they're more likely to eat better um, and do, do things that are in line with those intentions. Um, you know, there's, there's evidence to show that mindfulness does lead to better pro-environmental behaviors, more sustainable attitudes, but the crucial thing is how long does that take? Like what type of mindfulness training? And there's, and, and there's some evidence to say that it's probably about a year of practice before you have a kind of like scientifically observable change in how we behave. Um, so this isn't necessarily a five minute intervention, although I think um, having lots and lots of mindfulness informed things that aren't necessarily deep, deep practices like my, like my first informed nature connection are definitely part of the picture all the same. So there mm. we are. We, we, we kind of end up with a conclusion, which, which uh, I think ends with the line um, that the, the very things that we might need to do for our own survival have a, have a kind of uh, the benefit of also being the things that we need to do to make ourselves happier 
and a more flourishing society, a kind of a beautiful coincidence. Um, and uh, and so we, you know, the the, the improvements in well being and, um, and reductions in mental health problems that are, you know are well documented. We're now we're now through this narrative and through this framework, showing that there's been a neglected inner dimension, um, in our in, in our thinking, and it's actually what we need in order to sort of act, and uh, yeah, for an, an interest of us or our. So, what a perfect circle and a beautiful explanation. You know, what's interesting is that um, in the World Happiness Reports, the happiest societies typically are the Scandinavian ones. And those are ones in which there's a culture of humility and non show offness that encourages people to focus on intrinsic values versus external values. And it actually kind of says, and this is, by the way, you know, what's so interesting is many of the like the founding culture of america that one of the founding cultures were the, were the puritans who had this view that we should be humble and in the sight of the lord and in our needs and um so it's just a little it's 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 a piece this uh sense of arrogance versus humility and the arrogance that we think we can run the world and that we can geoengineer our way out of this etc mm. um so this this uh what you're really saying is to repair I mean, the world will repair it nature will repair itself it doesn't need us to repair it but for us to get out of the way to cease destructing it we need to reconnect ourselves within ourselves without ourselves between ourselves and other humans between humans and nature um we need this this reconnection and this reconnection uh needs to be done in some ways with more humility and less yeah. arrogance um and that in a way there's a the pathway to reconnection and that's the title of your report um is through finding these connections that are beyond the self yeah. Yeah. so um we're coming to the close of our time but just to a few of the questions so people have said this is amazing somebody says i want to teach, teach and practice and work with this so how can I teach and grow this? Like, so they're asking you for Jamie for a next. They're asking you, how can we take this and help you actualize this? So what's your plan? Well, that's a great question. And actually, that's one of the things we're hoping for as an outcome of this report. You know, we we created it with policymakers in mind to 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 for them to make to sort of large scale change, but also really hoping to inspire and and uh, inform, support, grassroots innovators and practitioners in, in, in various ways. Um, what we need help, uh, help, what we need help on is just spreading the word about it. You know, we, we put all of this effort, I mean, it's probably really sort of five years worth of, of, of thinking and effort to, 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 to get here, two years working directly on the research and writing. Um, and uh, And now I have, you know, Maybe five years ahead of me to 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 to, to do it justice and, and and get it out there. So, um, if if anyone has any suggestions for that, please do get in touch via my my website or the Mindfulness Initiative website, um, and uh, uh, and and let me know what we're hoping to do next. One of the things we're hoping to do next is help to connect some of the people who who, who are creating these innovations in mindfulness and compassion teaching. Um, and particularly those that are interested in supporting uh, young people um, between the ages of like, 18 and 25, particularly. So, 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 so younger uh, activists um, who the you know, evidence shows that this is you know, disproportionately hit, uh, hurting their, their resilience. Their... We want to support young activists. Really, we want to support people who support young activists. Right. So if you're, if you're developing a program, teaching something, um, uh or there's in, in any context we want to uh, particularly create some resources and pull together innovators potentially in in some some, some event activity so so if you know anyone working in that area or you, you are yourself doing so you know, please let us know um with regards to how do we how do we start including this i mean we've already mentioned jo joanna macy's work which has you know um 
uh, uh, in fact, I noticed someone in the questions was saying, you know, I've been doing this work for, mm -hmm. for, 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 for decades. You know, we're not saying we've come up with this narrative um, uh, or the first people to suggest this, but this is the first, as far as we're aware of, policy report that, that threads the evidence to get together in a coherent way. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so, yes, there's, there are existing resources out there, like the work that really connects, that, that, that's ready to go for you to take and, and run with and start doing, start doing groups with. Um, and, and yet there, are, there need to be a, a lot more innovation um, to apply this in different contexts and different groups and different, different language. So, um, so yeah, watch this space. That's one of the things we're hoping to support is that, that innovation. Wonderful. So Jamie, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, we really, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, I encourage everybody to look in the chat. Um, it'll be on for another minute or two, and then uh, it will disappear as we sign off. Um, but all the links that we've referred to are here. Um, and so, uh, Jamie, just say, in case people haven't looked at it, what is the address, uh, what's the web address of uh, the Mindful Project? Uh, so we are the, the mindfulnessinitiative.org. Um, I'll put the, uh, the, the, the document in the chat again. Um, and uh, and my website is is um, jamiebristow.com, and that's the best way to contact me. Uh, people find so wonderful, Jamie. Thank you so much for joining us today, and everybody in the audience. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just a reminder that uh, the Pathway for Planetary Health forums are offered free of charge, but we love it when you support us. So if you'd like to support our programming, please consider going to www.garrisoninstitute.org and clicking on the donate button and making a contribution or becoming a sponsor of these talks. One more thing, uh, you might want to look at some of the past talks. For example, there's a wonderful talk with uh, Joanna Macy that uh, should be available on our website, but also if you go to the Garrison Institute YouTube channel, you can find that. And she is a joy. Please join us for our next Pathways to Planetary Health Forum on December 6th with guest Heath Nero, who will discuss the power of protecting public lands. And Heath works with the WIS Foundation, which has so far permanently protected 83 million acres across the world. So thanks, Jamie. Thank you, audience. And we look forward to seeing you on December 6th.